all praises to the greatest. And when we say all praises to the greatest, there's only one. It's not a celebrity on Instagram. Like, uh, Sean Hannity calls Mark Levin the great one. Don't be dumb. You understand? There's only one great one. It's God. You don't ever subscribe the greatness of God and make it in a way that, God forbid, we might construe it to apply it to a man. Come on. No disrespect to Sean Hannity. Or anybody else But never call anybody the great one We're gonna get right into this right now man And I'm gonna teach you What happens to the Jews When they turn their back on God I'm gonna teach you what happens to the Jews When they thumb their nose God forbid at God We're gonna see what happens to the Jews When they think they're good without God We're gonna see what happens to the Jews When he leaves them to fight against their enemies alone. We're going to see what happens to the Jews when they refuse to hear the news from their prophets. Two prophets were killed by the kings of Judah, Isaiah and Zechariah, bro. Can you imagine that? Isaiah was murdered by his own grandson, Manasseh. Think about that. Zechariah was murdered by the Jews by the temple. For prophesizing, for saying what God is going to do to the Jews if they don't listen to this news. And I'm about to warn you again because we don't have prophets today to come and wake up the people. We see even back then the people didn't wake up. They were so steeped in sin that's hard to wake up. And I'll give you an example. What ends up, you ever see a dog? Even a dog. I'll give you a better example. Like a human being hypnotized. That's what it is. You get hypnotized by the sin. Why do you think the idol worshiping was so strong? There was something in it that you couldn't see. Just like my wavelength when I talk. You don't see it right in front of me. You have to be to a computer and break it down to some software. It's the same thing with this. That's why when you look into the eyes of a wicked woman, whether she's immodest or whether she's wicked, it's bad for your soul. But here we're talking about desires. So just like a person can be hypnotized by his desires, that's what's going to make this person be hard for him to get back to God you could come and give him such a speech to shake the heavens give him a great Dvar Torah tell him a beautiful story that you yourself will cry when you tell the story will not affect him will not affect the other day I told the Jew about the seven diamonds God gave you seven diamonds and he's asking for one diamond back and you can't give him the diamond back just like he gave you seven days of the week and he's asking for one day back you can't give him one day of your week to dedicate to Hashem, to show him that you love him, to read a little bit about his book, to understand a little bit about how he took us out of Egypt because of his kindness and made us a nation and how we were the only nation that accepted he was the only God. Every other nation had issues. Either they couldn't murder, they idol worship, they did something that was like not proving that there's one God who runs the show. The Jews believe that. And then after seeing the miracles, they knew that. And even after seeing the miracles, they allowed themselves to get seduced by evil. And when you let yourself get seduced by evil, it's a hard, hard battle. It's better not to get into the battle. It's like a little kid that starts smoking cigarettes. For what? If you taught him the right way and he never started even with this garbage and you broke it down to him that it's his enemy, it's bad for your health. It'll make your teeth yellow. It's bad for your heart. Don't do it. Whatever. You convince him at a young age to stay away from it. Then he doesn't even have to get into this mess. And it's the same thing with you and the Satan. Stop playing with the Satan. Whether it's your video games and you're married. And all night you're playing video games and ignoring your wife. It happens. I've seen it happen. You become hypnotized by the video game. Whether you're a married man that cheats on his wife. You become hypnotized by the beauty of a woman. There's so many sins out there that can hypnotize you. Idol worshiping, immorality, immodesty, eating, eating the food can hypnotize you. Look, you look at the food, you start eating, your eyes get big, your stomach sends a signal to the brain, stop, I'm full, bump that, you keep eating. Why? Because you got seduced by the sin. You got seduced by the physical pleasure. That's really what this talk is about, man. Don't get seduced by physical pleasure. You know why? Because on the left side, you can have physical pleasure that's fleeting. 
last seven seconds, last a minute, last even 20 minutes, I don't know. And on the other side, you have eternal pleasure that will last forever, 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 forever. Meaning it won't be tainted by anything. It'll be pure and a blessing. And that blessing, I'm telling you right now, when Hashem sees that you're willing to make yourself a proper, pure vessel for His knowledge and wisdom, and He sees that you want to get close to Him, forget about it. The minute He sees you're serious, He will open up your brain with such wisdom and knowledge how to navigate through these snakes and I say snakes, bro. There's one thing I'm telling you right now, man. There's somebody I just did this to and I actually feel bad. But for my mental health, I will not do it, bro. I don't care. Even if, God forbid, he got his feelings hurt. Because I'm here to protect my soul. You understand? I already identify you as somebody that's difficult to get along with. Bump that. Bump that, yo. I'll stay away from you, bro. I'll stay very far away from you. You know why? Because I don't need you. I have God. And when you have God, you don't need no friends. You don't need no nothing. I promise you. And for this one, I don't have to say the nether. I promise you that God will be there for you. If you just show him that you're looking for him. If you show him that you want to get to know him. If you show him that you care about his children. If you show him that you care about words written in his holy Torah. If you show him that you care about what the prophet said. If you show him that you really adore him, love him, and would do anything to hug him and say thank you for everything he did for you, then I tell you, and I promise you, God will send you blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And the reason I have to say B'li Nedr is because it's in the Torah. I have God's word back, back in me, you understand? It's not I told you, oh, this guy told me that this is going to happen. Nah, bro, nobody going to tell you anything's going to happen because he himself doesn't know what's going to happen. Now I'm going to get into some of my notes in the book of Jechariah. No, sorry, Jeremiah. <laughs> sorry, Hashem. The book of... I will tell you something quick about the Zechariah. Hashem wants me to tell you this. I'll tell it to you. Zechariah, the prophet, he was murdered by the Jews. And he got killed by the temple. Inside the temple. And there his blood laid. And it boiled for years. For years. His blood and a phenomenon would just sit there and boil on the floor and nobody understood what is going on they just ignored it and it got to a point they just kind of closed it off and just kind of ignored it and when Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon came to destroy Israel you know who he sent? Nebuchadnezzar his officer his general his fighters and when he came he saw this blood boiling on the floor and he asked the Jews what is this? what's going on? I never saw anything like this and they all played dumb to they were embarrassed, thank God, at least they were embarrassed. Embarrassed to say that we killed our prophet. So after he asked and he asked and he asked, he found out what's going on. So right away, he said, I'm going to kill all the priests, all the rabbis. And then I'm, and, and I'll kill them. And hopefully that will avenge the blood of Zechariah. He killed all the priests and all the rabbis, the blood still boiled. He killed the men for 20 years and up. The blood still boiled. He killed the children. It was still boiling. Till finally Nebuchadnezzar looked up to Shemayim and said, Zechariah, Zechariah, I killed the best of them. And that's when the blood calmed down. And right away, this general saw the power of God as clear as day. He saw a clear divine miracle in his face and he was clever enough not to chalk it up to some, you know, crazy thing in nature that just happens sometimes. No. He ended up going home, divorced his wife and became Jewish. You know why? Because he said, look at the punishment and how many people had to die to avenge the death of Zechariah and I was the one that killed these people. Now he wanted to do tshuva for murdering because he saw it was wrong. It's very deep what happened, yo. Nebu, Nebu Zardan, remember that name, bro. Converted to Judaism and was one of the most wicked people you can ever meet in your life. A murderer. A warrior. From the tribe of Babylon. Compared to a lion. Why? Because he attacks from the front. He ain't nervous.
And now we're going to tell you what's going to happen in the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to go right to Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 5. Thus says the Lord, what wrong have your forefathers found in me that they have distanced themselves from me and walked after vanity and have become themselves worthless? So right from here we learn that a person who's attached to vanity, meaning you're all day taking selfies, you're on TikTok, you're on Instagram, you're a dancer on some show on TV and you get, you know, vain because you know people look up to you and you become famous. The vanity leads to what? To emptiness, to worthlessness. You see it because a lot of the celebrities end up committing suicide. A lot of the famous people end up having empty lives. Why? Because they got tricked by the devil. They got sucked into this physical world. One of the things that's going to happen to you one day, God forbid, but it's going to because that's usually how it works. Unless you're alive to see Mashiach and then Hashem will put you to sleep and wake you right back up with no pain. You understand? But if you have to die like everybody else, then you're going to understand that on that day, you're going to see how fake this world is. So if you're super attached to your basketball team and now it's time for you to die, you're going to see how worth it is. Go ask a kid, God forbid, dying in a hospital of cancer if he cares about the Celtics won or lost. Yeah, there might be some that do. I'm not saying no. But... Normally, they would understand, bro. Who cares if they won or lost? My soul and my life is on the line. Even the atheist wakes up. You know why? Because he knows it's about to end. And when you know it's about to end, it's scary. The only time it's not scary when you know your life is about to end is when you know you're stuck to God. Then you have nothing to worry about. Then you die. It's like taking a flight to Hawaii. You go to Hawaii, boom, you're with your friend. Same thing with Hashem. Close your eyes. God knows your trial, this, that. It'll be a little bit tough, a little bit rough. The plane might shake a little bit, but in the end, you're going to get your destination, which is heaven. And Hashem will welcome you with open arms. Why? Because you dedicated your life to Him. Because you showed that you trusted Him. That you looked at this fake world for what it is. You didn't get enticed by stupidity. You didn't get enticed by lustful thoughts. That will consume your head and take you away from God. No. You stuck to him. You showed him that you loved him. You helped his children. You cried when you made mistakes. You were joyous when you did something good. That's going to get you to heaven. In the time of Moses, God said you became fat and kicked. Now in the time of Jeremiah, he says, You defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. Yo, yo. Hashem gets a little bit raw over here, bro. So I'm just giving you the warning that it might get a little bit tough. But I'll keep it in such a way that it'll keep it extra classy. When a man rejects God and worships idols, it's a twofold sin. One for turning your back on God, God forbid. And the second one for replacing God with something inferior. Instead of relying on God, the Jews were seeking help from Egypt and Assyria. What an embarrassment. And in the end, they both jerked us. Egypt played dumb. Assyria turned their back. <laughs> That's what happens. You want to go rely on nations that are anti-God? No problem. Hashem will put you in the hands of these nations. You don't get it? Look at all the Jews that followed the Goyim, that wanted to be Goyim. In the end, the Goyim rejected them. Think about it, bro. Jeremiah was devastated with his prophecies. The fact that the Jews were being abandoned by God and being turned over to such a cruel enemy broke the heart of Jeremiah. And he mentioned that in his prophecies. Jeremiah 2.19, God says, my fear is not in you, meaning you guys don't fear me. And when you don't fear God, you will be so susceptible to sin because you will justify the sin. Ah, come on, it's nature, it's life. Yo, God is clear. My fear is not in you. This is such a great proof that Reshit Chochma Yirat Hashem because when you do have it, you're going to be less likely to sin. You're not going to be susceptible to the sin. Wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. Israel's idol worshiping became ridiculous as Jeremiah dictated in chapter 2, verse 27, saying that the Jews said to a piece of wood, you're my father, and to a stone, you have given birth to me, for they have turned their backs on me, not their face. And in the time of trouble, they will arise 
and say, save us. But he won't save them. He won't. And why is he not saving them? Because he's a cruel father? God forbid, cruel father. Made the whole world with kindness. He's not a cruel father. But when you go against him and you show him ungratefulness, that you don't care, that you're going to turn your back on him, then he's going to do like he did on the Holocaust. He's going to turn his back on you. I'm sorry. That's what he says in the Gemara. I turned my back because they turned their back on me. Think about it. Jeremiah 3 verse 1. You played the harlot with many lovers. How could you wish to return to me again? Israel turned their back on God so many times that he compares her to a lover who cheated many times with different lovers. Think about that. Played the harlot. That's what Hashem is telling you, man. Don't play the harlot, bro. Israel was split into two kingdoms. One was the kingdom of Israel. Those were the ten tribes that got exiled. And then you had the kingdom of Judah. Both sinned against God. First, God punished the kingdom of Israel, which were the ten tribes, like I just said. And after witnessing this, the tribe of Judah refused to repent. So Hashem punished them. Jeremiah 12, 7. I have forsaken my house. I have left my heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemy. That's a vicious... Let me read that again and I'm going to show you a secret. I have forsaken my house. That means I turned my back on my house. I destroyed my temple or I'm going to destroy my temple. I have left my heritage. Meaning you guys left me, I left you. I've given the dearly beloved of my soul. Look how Hashem is calling us when He's sick of us. Right now, he's letting you know he's about to destroy the temple. He's about to leave you. And what does he say? As he's telling you he's going to leave you, he says to himself, but it's recorded in the Torah, I have given the dearly beloved of my soul. He's about to destroy you. And he's still calling you the dearly beloved of his soul. Think about that. That's the mercy and the love that God has for Israel. Don't ever forget that. While he's making a prophecy of your destruction, he's not calling you dirty and nasty and wicked and drop dead. No, it's hurting him because he's giving the dearly beloved of his soul into the hand of the enemy. Think about that. And then he follows it up. Jeremiah 3.12 For I am a merciful God, says the Lord, and I will not bear a grudge forever. I like that because he's not human. That's another main difference between God and humans. Humans work off emotions. They judge off emotions. That's why you can have somebody that did a million good things for you and did one thing wrong, and you can condemn them as a bad person. That's not justice. You have to judge him in totality like God does. God, when he judges you, he'll remember the kindness of your youth. He's not going to ignore that. If you don't, I like this, if you don't repent... The shame remains exposed in all its nakedness, covered only by the disgrace. Let me read that again. This is talking about sex crimes, and I want you to hear this and understand. If you don't repent, the shame remains exposed in all its nakedness, covered only by the disgrace. If you hear someone swearing in the name of God in order to affirm the truth of his words, do not assume that before you stands an honest man. He's simply making use of holy instruments in order to advance his nefarious activities. <laughs> it's amazing, man. The Torah will teach you how to be a master psychologist, bro. Because psychology is the study of the mind. It's the study of the brain. It's the study of the spirit. It's the study of the soul. And it's the study of reason. And you know that if a guy has to get up and start making all these claims that he's innocent, something ain't right. And how many, I study this, man. How many times, go look on YouTube. People that got caught 100% in a lie. 100%. Like Anthony Weiner is a great example. May God bless him because I know he's a Jew and I know he was very arrogant and God really humbled him. Man, what a great example of God taking a person and humbling them. You ask him and he'll be the first one to tell you that it's true. That it's true. What did I read to you before? If you don't repent, the shame remains exposed in all its nakedness, only covered by its disgrace. 
and he was lying and lying instead of just saying I messed up and he was married to a Goya that's already the punishment right there you're going against the word of Hashem what did I tell you when you go against the word of Hashem from the onset it's already cursed that's what you don't get bro the way it starts is gonna have a big impact on the way it finishes and that's the facts so hopefully he got rid of his wife and did whatever punishment he had to go through and now hopefully he could fix himself up it's just a love for another Jew I don't know him nothing I just saw on TV you know when he got in trouble and it was Hashem really destroyed this guy go look at the documentary they had on him how embarrassing that is I'm shocked to even let it out yo I'll be honest with you bottom line is when Hashem puts his eye on you to destroy you you're done you're so much better off fixing what you need to fix now. Break this chain of stubbornness. The Jews have to wake up and understand enough of being the stiff-necked nation. Enough of being am naval velo chacham. Enough of thinking that your intellectual superiority is going to save you. It's not. You even saw in the Holocaust there were many bankers and lawyers and God, judges and God knows what nothing saved them when the wrath of God is coming it's like a category 5 hurricane bro you better prepare and do something Jeremiah 5 6 chapter 5 verse 6 therefore a lion out of the forest will slay them a wolf will ravage them and a watchful panther will prowl by the cities and devour whoever goes out for their transgressions are many and their backsliding has increased. The lion, like I told you earlier, attacks from the front. The wolf attacks in stealth. And the panther sits and waits for the opportune time to attack his prey. These three animals are references to the three nations that fought against Israel. Babylon is the lion. Assyria is the fox. And Greece is the panther. If you see your brother sinning and you don't say something, I always say this, and people are always telling me, no, 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 it can't be, it can't be. Well, it is, and I'm going to prove it to you. If you were a father and you were watching off your balcony and you had two sons that were playing basketball on the playground and you saw one of your sons was bullying somebody or picking on somebody or doing a big sin, and his brother didn't correct him, didn't stop him, didn't give him a speech, didn't grab him by the arm and say, nah, why are you punching this kid? Why are you bullying him? The father will get mad not only at the son who committed the bullying, but at the other son that didn't do something to correct it. Facts. So don't argue with me when I tell you, God is the father and we're his children. And when he sees one of his children, doing something mean to another child and his other children are not saying something he holds them just as guilty like somebody told me oh there were so many religious people that died in the holocaust and it's true a lot did and it's sad but there is an explanation why because they were religious and they didn't care about their neighbor let the dad, it's not my business let him do what he wants so all of a sudden I have to care about this guy just because he's from my nation give me a break then you don't understand the first thing about Judaism. Because Kol Yisrael, Aravim, Zeh, Lazeh, we're all responsible for one another, whether you like it or not. That's why in the Vidui, you say all these things, please forgive me for this and for that and for that. Some of the things you don't even do. But you're saying it, why? Because as one nation, we all pray for each other. You know that, yo. Now I'm going to tell you of a beautiful miracle that God does for the nation of Israel. Watch this. The rain in the land of Israel appears in the early fall months and ceases to fall in the late spring. You know why? Because if it would rain in the late spring months, it would ruin the newly harvested grain that's being dried by the sun. Hashem set it up in such a system that first it will get wet in the early months and then if it keeps getting wet, it's going to make the seed rotten and it's not going to grow. So Hashem now brings the sun and it dries out the grain and allows it to grow. Soon I'm going to tell you some deep secrets about the rain. So just hold on because I'm going to get there in a second. There are three people, <clears throat> excuse me, that God hates. An old swindler because he didn't learn. He's still swindling people in his old age. That's disgusting. 
And then you have a wealthy thief. He hates him because he's paying him in this world to get rid of him. And a proud pauper. He made you a pauper to make you humble, not to be proud. That's why he hates these three people because they go against him and what he wants. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 23. They will grasp hold of the bow and spear. You know what that means? That they'll kill you up close and they'll kill you from afar. They're cruel and have no mercy. Their voice is talking about Babylon. Listen, Jeremiah 6, 23. They will grasp hold of the bow and the spear. They are a cruel nation with no mercy. Their voice roars like the sea. They ride upon horses and they are marshaled as men of war against you. Wow, against you, the daughter of Zion. Again, he calls us his daughter out of love. Even when he's telling you that they're marshaled against you as men of war, he still calls you the daughter of Zion. Ah, I like that. There were seven gates to the temple. Three on the northern side, three on the south side, and the main gate was to the east. That's where God commanded Jeremiah to speak at the main gate. That's why they all got upset because he came with such words. A lot of them got upset. They wanted to kill him. People from his hometown tried to poison him. And he kept warning them, the, the threat is coming from the north. That's where the tribe of Dan was. So they were going to come through the tribe of Dan and then enter the land of Israel to destroy. Wow. If sinners imagine that they may freely transgress and always be assured forgiveness merely by entering the temple, then the temple itself becomes a means of encouraging sin. That is deep. If sinners imagine that they may freely transgress and always be assured forgiveness merely by entering the temple, meaning because the temple's there, I, okay, don't worry about it, I go to the temple, I give a little sacrifice, big deal. Then the temple itself becomes a means of encouraging sin and God has to destroy it because anything attached to sin eventually will be destroyed. And there's your proof why God had to destroy it because the temple was encouraging Jews to sin. Think about how nuts that is. Jeremiah 7.20 Therefore says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my fury will be poured out upon this place, upon man, upon beast, upon the trees in the field, and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and not be quenched. Wow. What makes the Passover sacrifice so unique is that it's once a year, and it's done in groups. God only introduced the laws of sacrificing after He took the Jews out of Egypt and gave them the Torah. The Jews were living in Egypt for 200 years and were tainted by the impure practices of the Egyptians. Sex crimes, idol worship, everything against God they were doing. So God didn't want to give them the laws of sacrifices while they were still impure. So he waited till they were more purified and refined and then he gave them that part of the Torah dealing with the sacrifices. I like that. They used to worship the idol of Molech outside the city of Jerusalem and Tophet. So you know what God said? God said, I'm going to make this land of Tophet, this place where you sacrifice outside the city of Jerusalem. I'm going to make it into a mass grave. That's exactly what he did because they were killing their children over there. There was an idol by the name of Molech. Had the face, if I'm not mistaken, of an ox or some kind of an animal that was hollow on the inside, constantly heated with a burning fire. And when you would bring your kid to be sacrificed, there were seven partitions for different sacrifices. In order to get to the seventh partition and see the idol face to face, you had to sacrifice your kid. Now, it would be the face of an animal with the body of a human, standing with his hands out, palms facing up, to put the baby there. And that's where they would put the baby on his two hands and sacrifice it. And the baby would burn alive. Very scary, yo. Varies. It would melt because the metal was so hot that the minute they put the baby on it, it would basically melt and die. And the craziest thing was they used to play the drums and the flute and all this music to drown out the sound of the crying baby. They hypnotized them. I'm telling you, bro. This is a hypnosis. They got hypnotized from the sin. Listen to me, man. When you dabble in the same sin a lot over and over and over again... It's going to take over your brain where you're going to make dumb decisions like murdering your own kid, sacrificing it to an idol. That's exactly what happened. This is why God said, no problem. You want to play? I can also play games. Israel has prided herself as being a wise and erudite people 
who knew how to pen deep words of wisdom. Jeremiah attacks this smug feeling of intellectual superiority by saying, what good is it with all these deep words you dictate if you don't follow the real words, which are the words of the Torah? Again, let me read this. Israel always prided herself as being a wise and intelligent nation, one who knew how to pen deep words of wisdom. Jeremiah attacks this smug feeling of intellectual superiority by saying, if you do not observe the Torah, what good are these deep words that you write down? There are four people that don't see the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah is the divine presence of God. It's a slanderer, a flatterer, somebody who flatters the wicked, a liar, and a mocker. Slanderer, flatterer, mocker, liar. Remember that. And for the mockers and the slanders especially, what does God say? Their tongue is like a sharpened arrow. Wow. All is in the hands of heaven except the fear of heaven. What that means is that when a person is born, everything is written. Will he get married? What color eyes he has? Will he be rich? Will he be poor? Will he be good looking? Will he not? But the only thing that's not dictated in heaven is whether he'll be a tzaddik or a rasha. That he has free will to do. So that's why it says, all is in the hands of heaven, except the fear of heaven. One of the main reasons that God chose us to be his holy nation is because we believed in one God. And God wants the Jews to teach the Gentile nations that you don't need an intermediary to get to God. You have a direct line with God, whether you're an Arab, whether you're a Jew, even, God forbid, you're from the tribe of Amalek and you want to call out to God and do tshuva, you have a direct line to God. Think about it, bro. Now, I don't know, because God says to destroy Amalek and he never wants to see them again. So if Hashem says that your sins are way too much and the gate of heaven is closed, then you will not repent. But I don't know Hashem to be the type to shut the door in your face knowing that you changed. You could be the worst person in the universe. You fix yourself, Hashem will accept you back. It's facts. That's the way He made the world. This is beautiful. Charity saves one from death. When a Jew does a good deed, since he has a spark of God in his soul, that has a direct effect on the heavens and in turn on his own fate. I'll show you a great example. There was a guy who went to work and he was supposed to die. He had a decree in heaven that he was going to die. Sex crimes, this, arrogance, I don't know, whatever it was in Shemaim. They decreed that this was, guy was going to die. You know what happened? That day when he went to lunch, he saw that one of his co-workers didn't have food. So he split his sandwich and gave him half. And he ended up living. That's a story in the Gemara. I just flipped it in a more modern way. But that's a story in the Gemara. He was supposed to be bit by a snake. But when he went to go get his sandwich out to split it, he saw the snake and he killed it. And he got saved. Why? Because of an act of charity. Staka, Torah, Tfilah, Tetzil Mimavet. These things will save you from death. The Torah for sure. It's a tree of life and hold on to it. That we already know. It's that guy I just showed you. And Tfilah, Ninveh. Ninveh. Ninveh, the city of Ninveh, saved themselves with Tfilah. What a beautiful lesson to the Jews, man. God forgave the non-Jews when they did repentance. He's not going to forgive you. He's going to forgive you, I promise you. That was a rhetorical question. Now I'm going to tell you something beautiful about rain. Rain is the only resource whose origin is not from the earth itself. Its process and formation should be seen as a miracle. In addition, rain is a phenomenon which acts contrary to the laws of nature. By rising to the skies, it's transported far distances by the winds. Rain defies the laws of gravity. And not only that, when you have lightning storms, it's fire and water mixed which is another miracle, but nobody sees it. Do you know why Israel is God's chosen nation? Because they chose to understand that God is the one and only God. Remember that. That's why Hashem is so against idol worshiping for the Jews. He chose you because you don't idol worship. 
And now you became idol worshippers. Why? Because you mix with the goyim. You mix with the nations of the land. And I told you, don't mix. It's like I have a kid, God forbid. Not me, but if a person has a kid, he goes to public school. God forbid, I'm even talking like this. But this is the reality. And you tell him, stay away from those kids. Don't mix with those kids. They curse all the time. They bully people. They talk down to the girls. They're not good people. Stay away. Don't mix with those kids. And what does your kid do? He mixes with those kids. And then when he marries a Goya, he's in shock. He doesn't understand how he got himself to this position. <laughs> and now, God forbid, you marry a Goya, have a kid with her. That's not so easy to fix, my friend. And this I like. During the time of Saint Khalim, God made a miracle and saved us from his hand. And who was the king that had the merit to have that miracle happen during his reign? King Cheskiyahu. Remember that. Hashem, I just want to thank you so much for letting this video come out exactly the way I wanted to. I'm happy with it and I appreciate you. And never ever am I going to think that it's my talent and wisdom that allows this to happen. It's not Because even my talent and wisdom Is from you <laughs> Hashem uses me as a vessel To teach his children And I appreciate that Hashem It shows me that you love me It shows me that you care about me It shows me that you have your eye on me It shows me that you're watching me And you're looking to see what I'm gonna do And I appreciate that you gave me the power The intellect And the drive to make these videos on YouTube for your children to hear it, accept it, to love it, adore it, Joy. and to always know that this is the true word of God. Over here by Camp Kika, there's no bribes with money, there's no ulterior motive, there's nothing. This is the pure word of God, and it will always be like this. Love you, Hashem. Joy.